Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Parkinson's Academy webinar. My name is Diga Hastus, and I'm the head of the Parkinson's Academy and the chair for both sessions this afternoon. Before we start, I would like to express a huge thank you to Zambon Limited for sponsoring the learning this afternoon. We will be kicking off with Annette, Nicolo and Kelly, who will be discussing when is Parkinson's not Parkinson's. So, without any further delay, let me hand you over to Annette to start this afternoon's session. Annette. Thanks, Daiga. Okay, so welcome everybody to this afternoon's webinar on when is Parkinson's not Parkinson's. And for this first part, as Daiga says, we're gonna be looking at differential diagnosis. So my name is Annette and I'm a clinical and academic professor of nursing and I work up in the northeast of England and I've been a Parkinson's nurse for a long time. So unfortunately, I've seen quite a lot of people now with differential diagnosis over that time. So what are we going to cover this afternoon? We are sorry to start off with, I'll start with my disclosures briefly. And then over the next 45 minutes, we're going to have a look at how to differentiate between the complex conditions that present like Parkinson's but aren't. And I'll also be going through some of those signs and symptoms that you might see in clinic, what we call those red flags for you to look out for. I'm then going to pass over to my colleague, Professor Pavese, and he's going to look at observations and clinical tests that we can do, and also looking at scans and how we can read them to try and give us a bit more an idea about what the diagnosis might be. And then finally, we'll hand over to Kelly, who will look at an MDT approach to managing a typical Parkinsonism and finally end with a case study for you. So I want to start us off really by thinking about the NICE guidelines and what that tells us that we need to be doing. So I'm sure you've all aware of the NICE guidelines that were republished in 2017. And within that, it talks about suspect Parkinson's in people presenting with tremor, stiffness, slowness, balance problems and or gait disorders. So any of those Parkinsonian features, they're saying suspect Parkinson's. And then they're saying to, to if you suspect Parkinson's, to refer people quickly and untreated. Now, the untreated bit is really important, as I'll come on to in a little bit, um, to an expert in, in, in differential diagnosis of this condition. So already it's telling us that, yeah, although Parkinson's might be one of the main conditions, there are other conditions that we need to be looking out for. And that person you refer through to needs to be an expert in, in those other conditions as well, not just in Parkinson's alone. It's also asking us to use a diagnostic criteria. So within the UK here, we use the brain bank criteria. And I'm sure many of you all have looked at already and realized that probably a little, it's a little bit out of date now. So there are some of the criteria there that aren't quite accurate anymore, but it's still kind of a, a standardized criteria that we can all use. The MDS have also published their diagnostic criteria a few years ago. And I must admit, I found that quite helpful as well, because within that, it's also got some of the prodromal features that we might see within Parkinson's. So actually using a combination of, you know, diagnostic um, criteria, it can be really helpful. And again, it's recommended that we use that within our clinical practice. And then finally, because we know that it's really difficult and lots of these things don't have any kind of confirmed tests or scans, we need to review that diagnosis on a regular basis. And in Parkinson's, it's saying we need to review that roughly over six to 12 months to look for some of those atypical features that we need to look out for and that we'll be talking about today. So this talks about atypical Parkinsonism. So what is atypical Parkinsonism? Sometimes you might have heard it referred to as Parkinson's plus syndromes. And particularly today, we're going to focus on the three major ones that you might see. And that's multiple system atrophy, progressive nuclear palsy and corticobasal degeneration. Now, as the NICE guidelines suggest, that these often present like Parkinson's, but there are some differences. So these conditions progress more rapidly than straightforward Parkinson's would do. There's often a lack of treatment response, particularly to levodopa. They have some additional red flag symptoms that I'll come on to over the next few slides for this. And their prognostic outcome is different um, across all three conditions. So your prognosis with MSA is anywhere from seven to 10 years from that diagnosis or from those very first symptoms. And also with MSA, you can see sudden death. For PSP, you're looking at a life expectancy of anywhere between five and seven years normally from symptom onset. And then from cortical basal, it's usually about five to 10 years that we see. These are less common conditions, definitely. So for MSA, you're looking probably about 3,300 people with across the UK will have MSA and about 4,000 people have PSP and cortical basal again here within the UK. So they are more rare, definitely, but it's still something we need to be aware of. And as such, it's really important when we diagnose people from the very beginning of their journey, we think about our confidence in that diagnosis. 
So when you first see somebody who looks a bit like Parkinson's, we can't say definitely, yes, it is, because we need to see what, how they progress, how they change over time and how they respond to treatment. So you might want to think about, you know, a diagnostic confidence within your writing. And certainly when we speak to patients about how certain we are about that diagnosis, because there's nothing more distressing than seeing somebody who's been diagnosed initially with Parkinson's and then having to say to them a little further down the line, I'm really sorry, but this is no longer Parkinson's. This is something that's, you know, rarer, but often we've got that change to, um, you know, their prognosis. So again, thinking about making sure that's explained at the very beginning of people's journeys when we see them. So let's have a look at some of those red flags I talked about before. So for MSA, there are a number of red flags to look out for. And particularly with MSA, it's looking at those autonomic dysfunction features that you might see. So early changes to problems with bladder, urgency people would talk about frequency, nocturia or retention. Postural hypertension, yes, we see that with people with Parkinson's, but really early on with MSA, we might see that. And again, we can test that when we see something in clinic where we're doing blood pressures. For men particularly, we can talk about sexual health and erectile dysfunction. Again, that's one of those early autonomic features that we might see. And we talk about, but again, often, you know, we don't want to talk about things that might be embarrassing, might be difficult. But unless we question people about this, often they won't disclose that, you know, automatically to us. One of the things that can sometimes be quite obvious is cold extremities. And certainly I've seen discoloration to fingertips um, for some people um, with MSA. So again, it's worth having a look at hands, having a look at fingertips, seeing if there's any change of discoloration or if they're kind of cold. MSA can often result in having difficulty with speaking and swallowing early on in the diagnosis that we wouldn't expect to see that early on. And one of the other kind of quite unusual symptoms that some people um, report is having this stride or, or size. And I've certainly having that <gasps> <gasps> in clinic with somebody's come and presented to me and talked about it. Again, often we sometimes see that over night time, it's really helpful to ask the partners about their breathing over night time and if they see or hear any changes to their breathing overnight. And for some people with MSA, they also have difficulty controlling emotions, so laughing or crying. And as I said, poor response to treatment and fast progression. So those are just some of the red flags that you might see within um, MSA that you can look out for within clinic. The MDS produced new diagnostic criteria that's published earlier on this year in April, so it's really worth having another look at that. Um, and there's another nice paper on the bottom there that looks at both pro, pre-motor and non-motor symptoms within MSA that might help you with the diagnosis. And MSA Trust have also got some fantastic information, both for healthcare professionals, but also for patients and their loved ones. So for PSP, what are those red flags we're looking out for? One of the early ones is falling early on. And often people report about falling backwards, which you wouldn't expect to see with Parkinson's. Having that postural instability, being more unbalanced, being more unsteady on their feet. Restricted eye movements is a classical one. So upward and downward gaze can be altered as well, as well as reduced blink rate. And people often report about having double vision as well, or difficulty with their, their vision. And often they have quite a fixed stare to their, you know, to their, to their um, facial expression. They might have slowed or slurred speech, um, or kind of a bit of a growly voice to them, but also difficulty with swallowing and with speech generally and with word finding. People with um, PSP might also have cognitive changes um, um, to the, within that, and that might, people think that might be in like an early dementia. And some people can also present with some impulsive behaviours. And again, these risk-taking behaviours, they just don't appreciate that putting themselves at risk um, with some activities, particularly with the mobility. And again, that poor response to treatment and that rapid progression is things you need to be looking out for. Again, the Mood Disorder Society have done diagnostic criteria for you to have a look at for further details about these red flags to think about. And the PSP Association have got some fantastic information again for healthcare professionals and for people with, with the condition and their loved ones to have a look at what this really means as well in a bit more detail. And then finally, the cortical basal degeneration red flags. This again presents again um, as a highly asymmetric presentation that we might see. We might see apraxia with this clumsiness or awkwardness within the hands a dystonia and again that can be both upper and lower body so I have seen it hands and feet but also in arms and legs that people can present with. You can observe myoclonic uh, jerks and these jerky movements people can have and also this other kind of strange one that people can sometimes get is this alien what we call this alien limb syndrome so when one arm in particular is reaching or grasping automatically and they just don't seem to have any control over that. We can also see slurred or distorted speech with somebody and again, we can see cognitive changes and behavioural changes with anxiety, depression, and apathy. Again, for individuals with cortical basal, often there's a poor response to treatment and the rapid progression of symptoms that they might have. 
And again, there's diagnostic criteria that was developed a few years ago that will again describe this a bit with further detail. And for people, um, information for patients, um, the PSP Association have got again some really nice information that people can have a look at to differentiate between some of these conditions. So that's just a really quick whistle stop saw of some of those red flag symptoms to look out for. All right. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pass over to Professor Pavese, who will then look at what other tests or uh, scans we can do within clinic that might help us to confirm a diagnosis of atypical Parkinsonism. Thank you, Annette, for this beautiful uh, introduction. So I will continue uh, talking about uh, the diagnostic tests that we have in, uh, um, in the clinic. Uh, to make a better diagnosis of this uh, atypical uh, Parkinsonian uh, syndromes. And uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, when we talk about uh, imaging techniques that we can use for the diagnosis of these uh, disorders, we can think of structural uh, and functional uh, techniques. The structurals give um, uh, images of the brain. It's like a photograph, and the example is the MRI. And then we also have uh, imaging technique that enable us to look the way the, the brain works. And these are PET that is mostly used in research because it's quite expensive and SPECT that is more used in clinical settings. I would start with uh, um, uh, functional because as I said, are the ones used in uh, clinical settings and they can be uh, quite useful in the uh, treatment, in the diagnosis of this um, uh, Parkinsonian uh, syndromes. Um, I'm not sure if you are familiar with PET, with positron emission tomography. Just very quickly, uh, we inject a radioisotope that produces um, uh, positrons that are detected uh, in, by the, the ring. And after processing, we have images very nicely um, with very nice resolution. This is an axial um, uh, uh, plane where you can see the caudate and the putamen and the, and the, the striatum. And this is a fluorodopa. Uh, PET image that looks at the synthesis of uh, um, dopamine in the uh, um, uh, dopaminergic terminals. Uh, SPECT is a single photon emission to compute tomography. Uh, here we also have a radioactive substance, but uh, the um, um, location is, is just a single photon, so we don't have a nice uh, ring. We only have the um, camera on one side that is rotating, and we still have very nice images, but you see the resolution seems to be is less. So you don't have the division in uh, codate and putamen, but you still have a very nice representation of the, um, of the, um, of the striatum. And of course, these uh, techniques are used to look at the uh, nagrostriatal um, uh, pathway that is affected in, in Parkinson and in Parkinsonism. Uh, it starts with dopaminergic cells in the substantia nigra, but the axon, the, termi the terminals, reach the uh, striatum where they are involved in the uh, motor um, network in the brain. And again, this is the, uh, um, the image as we see. So as you can see, there is a very nice uh, correspondence uh, and uh, mm, anatomical and functional uh, in this area. So you have a very good resolution. Now, uh, these techniques are very important. Um, can be fluorodopa, can be, the, this is the DAT scan. Uh, they give a sig a similar information. So this is the striatum in normal uh, uh, people. You can see the codate and the putamen very nicely represented. And these are patients with Parkinson's. And you can see that the signal is not as good as in the other ones, there is a missing part, uh, it, both in the in this DOPA scan and in the DAT scan, and this is indication that you have a loss of terminals. So there is a loss of neurons and dopaminergic terminals, and this is suggestive as supporting the diagnosis of a Parkinsonism. In fact, it is uh, normal in a condition like essential tremor, in dystonic tremor, in uh, drug-induced Parkinsonism, or in vascular Parkinsonism while is affected, is abnormal in Parkinson disease and in all the other Parkinsonisms. Now, um, so it can be very useful to differentiate Parkinsonisms from uh, other conditions, uh, but uh, it's not really quite useful to differentiate Parkinson from atypical Parkinsonisms. Now, sometimes what we, um, uh, what we know in practice, this is a fluorodopa scan, if you have uh, two uh, patients, one with Parkinson and one with MSA, for example, that are matched for disease duration for severity, what you can see that in Parkinson, there is the trend with the reduction at the, in the posterior part of the putamen, while a patient with a multiple system atrophy 
at the same level of disease have a more homogeneous reduction of uh, dopaminergic function in the striatum, suggesting that the, the dis dopaminergic dysfunction is more widespread in a patient with multiple system atrophy. And the same is also for PSP. But uh, uh, in general, there is a very uh, uh, considerable overlap. So don't use uh, that scan to differentiate Parkinson from atypical Parkinson is because you will not have an answer from that scan. There are, however, other scans that can be used for that purpose. For example, we have uh, FDG PET. FDG PET is a, a um, scan that enables to look at the glucose metabolism in the brain, and we can see then areas with increased uh, consumption of glucose and areas with a reduced consumption of glucose. And you can see that in Parkinson, usually there is a good high signal. So in the striatum, there is an hyperactivity of glucose and that costs probably for compensatory mechanisms. In MSA, uh, where we have uh, a, a larger um, loss of um, synapses, so not only the presynaptic terminal, but also the postsynaptic terminals, you see that the uh, consumption of glucose is reduced. So it's hypometabolism in the, um, in the, in, in the striatum. This is quite uh, useful for the um, differential diagnosis. There are also very smart um, softwares now that they can put together, um, we say covariate, areas of um, increase and areas of reduction of glucose metabolism in the brain. And you can see that there are very, very characteristic um, networks and uh, patterns in uh, Parkinson's and in MSA. So in uh, Parkinson's, you see that there is a uh, increase, as I said, in the striatum, and this is the globus pallidus, and there are some uh, reduction in uh, cortical uh, areas, including the promoter. While in, in MSA, you see the reduction, but there is no increases. So again, this seems to be quite reproducible. Uh, they can be used also to assess uh, disease progression and the, the, some uh, treatment. For example, in Parkinson, this seems to improve with deep brain stimulation. Um, this study by Eckert et al. also um, uh, looked at um, uh, different patterns in all the conditions. And you can see again that this can be used because can differentiate patients. So in Parkinson, as we said, there is an increase in the, uh, in the, in the striatum. In MSA, you can see the reduction of metabolism. In PSP, you can see that the reduction of metabolism is mostly in the brainstem, while there are compensatory uh, increases in other part of the brain. And in cortical basal degeneration, as Annette said, there is a, a more um, asymmetrical involvement, and you can see that the hypofunction in the cortex is more prominent on one side than the other. Now, uh, this is uh, particularly useful, but there is still no standardized way to look at this uh, in, uh, uh, in different centers. So the utility is uh, quite um, uh, reduced at the moment uh, because you need very expert centers to do this and probably more standardized uh, parameters. However, there is a future, there is a hope in the future because we know that this uh, conditions have a different pathology. For example, we know that the multiple system atrophy and the Parkinson's disease and uh, dementia will you body are synucleinopathies. So there is an accumulation of alpha misfolded alpha synuclein uh, in the uh, neurons or in the uh, astroglia cells, while in, uh, in, uh, in uh, um, progressive supranuclear palsy and in cortical basal degeneration uh, is uh, the tau protein that is misfolded and cause uh, 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 neuronal damage. So we start having some uh, tracers for, uh, for misfolded protein, uh, more advanced for the, the, the tau. Um, this is one of the most um, Floritin PI 2620 has been quite investigated in PSP. Uh, for alpha synuclein, unfortunately, we are still behind. But uh, very, very recently at the um, at Alzheimer and Parkinson disease conference uh, um, two months ago, they presented the data with this new tracer. Uh, which uh, in, let's say, from was able to uh, uh, bind alpha synuclein in the cerebellar of patients with multiple system atrophy uh, with a, a cerebellar um, type, uh, but it was not able to bind uh, to alpha synuclein in Parkinson's and in MSAP. So um, let's say something promising, but uh, not uh, as good as we hoped. But uh, people are working on this. So 
hopefully in the future, we will have uh, very good markers, um, tracers to look at this different um, pathology in these different conditions. Something about now the MRI that can be particularly useful. As you know, this, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, uh, with the MRI, uh, we have uh, images of the brain. These are sagittal and these are axial planes. And in here, you can see uh, the, um, the, the midbrain with the substantia nagra, and that is the, the striatum. Normally in Parkinson's disease, especially if in early stage, uh, there is a normal scan with the normal sequences that we can uh, currently use. In a patient with MSAP, uh, there are different changes that can be reported. For example, uh, can, can be seen an atrophy of the uh, putamen. Uh, the putamen can be hypointense, as in here, or there can be this characteristic uh, hyperintensity, uh, which is called putaminal slit. Uh, that seems to be quite um, uh, visible in patients with MSA, although uh, with new uh, MRI uh, scanners, uh, three Tesla, uh, they tend to be quite common even in um, elderly, um, in, uh, in uh, PD patients, so in, in, in LT patients. So uh, it's very important to uh, put always together the imaging findings uh, with the clinical uh, uh, um, features of these patients. In MSA uh, cerebellar, MSA C, uh, you have uh, in this character, a very uh, um, typical sign uh, is called hot cross band because uh, re resemble uh, the hot cross. This is related to the, um, to the, um, um, the degeneration in the uh, pontine uh, neurons and the uh, degeneration, uh, se the selective degeneration of the um, malinated transverse um, 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 cerebellar fibers, while the uh, corticospinal um, uh, um, projections are preserved. So they have this typical aspect. Again, it's not characteristic, it can be, uh, it's not specific of uh, uh, MSA, because even patients with um, some um, uh, uh, cerebellar at ataxia can have uh, this uh, characteristic sign. In, um, in patients who have MSAP, uh, you can also look at the atrophy of the pons, atrophy of the cerebellar here, and you can notice it, um, the dilation of the fourth ventricles. In uh, PSP, uh, the pathology is mostly in the, in the midbrain. You can see here that there is atrophy, and uh, that is uh, quite characteristic. And is, you can see that is called the king penguin sign because it resembles in here, the head of the uh, king penguin. It's also called uh, humming bird sign uh, because it also has the aspect of uh, um, uh, humming bird, um, um, uh, bird. Uh, if you look at the same uh, images, uh, PSP on the axial um, uh, plane uh, now, you can have what is called the Mickey Mouse sign where there is a quite preservation of the um, cerebral pedunculus, uh, there is an atrophy of the tegmentum uh, of the midbrain, so giving this characteristic aspect of uh, Mickey Mouse. Uh, again, it's not uh, it's seen in PSP, but it's also seen uh, sometimes in other conditions. So you always need to, to put together the uh, imaging with the um, clinical features. Uh, for PSP, there are also more elaborated uh, um, measures. Uh, there is planime planimetry, so you can measure. There are different ratios that have been uh, reported. There is the uh, um, uh, MP ratio, where you calculate the area of the midbrain and the pons. Uh, there is the um, uh, magnetic resonance, resonance Parkinson, uh, Parkinson index. Again, here you also look at the um, cerebellar pedunculus. And in 2018, another index was introduced where you also keep in, uh, it's called um, uh, um, MRRIP20, where you, uh, you use this uh, NRP uh, index, but at the same time, you also use the, um, the width of the um, third ventricle. Uh, so it seems to be a more sensitive and more specific uh, measure uh, of PSP. Uh, there are cutoffs values that can, um, can be useful to differentiate uh, Parkinson from um, 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 uh, um, PSP, but also PSP from other um, um, unclear uh, form of uh, Parkinsonism. 
cortical basal degeneration. Um, again, there are some red flags that if you are quite uh, lucky, you can find. And one is the um, asymmetrical involvement of the cortex. For example, you, here you can see that there is a right involvement atrophy is more prominent than the, the left, not only in the parietofrontal uh, area, but also posteriorly in the um, uh, occipital area. Uh, one thing that we need to, to say is that uh, this um, um, signs usually tend to uh, occur in more advanced, more established patients. They are quite difficult to find in very early stages. Now, uh, there are new MRI sequences where you can look at the neuromelanin. Uh, the uh, neuromelanin um, has a good bold signal in MRI. So what happened is that you can see that uh, in LT uh, volunteer, you have quite a high intensity in the area of the um, substantia nigra, reflecting the content of uh, neuromelanin. In patients with Parkinson's disease, there is a reduction, and uh, is not only the substantia nigra, neuromelanin is also uh, contained in the uh, loc uh, locus ceruleus, and you can see that in, in PD patients, there is a reduction of the content of neuromelanin in the locus ceruleus as well. Unfortunately, uh, there are still limited studies in atypical Parkinsonism in Newcastle. Uh, we got a grant from the um, Multiple System Atrophy Trust uh, to look at neuromelanin, uh, NODI, and other MRI sequences in patients with MSA. Um, some of the data will be presented at the next Movement Disorder uh, Society in a meeting in, in Madrid. Uh, the very last test that can be used is uh, MIBG. Uh, SPECT cardio uh, scintigraphy. With this, we can look at the sympathetic uh, innervation of the uh, of the um, uh, of the heart, and that is what it looks like in in normal subjects. So you see, you have a nice uh, uptake in this area. While in patients with Parkinson who have uh, um, sympathetic denervation of the heart, you see that there is a reduction of this um, signal. Interestingly, in patients with MSA, uh, the um, sympathetic uh, innervation of the heart is preserved. So uh, MSA patients uh, usually have the same scan as a normal person. Said that, uh, there are some limitations to this technique as well. First of all, uh, even in patients with uh, Parkinson in ONER stage, uh, it seems that 50% uh, uh, have a normal um, um, uh, a MIBG scan. So especially in the early phases, it might be a little bit tricky to make a diagnosis on base of, of that. And the other thing is that uh, this uh, technique is still very uh, operator dependent. So again, there is a problem with standardization and not all centers are able to, to do this. Uh, so uh, it could be something that in the future could become particularly useful. Uh, we need a consensus and we need a more sort of harmonization of data in order to have um, standard criteria that we can look at that. So to conclude, uh, imaging can be uh, um, useful, but um, we still don't have a perfect biomarker for a typical Parkinsonism, and that is definitely an unmet uh, need. As I said, MRI seems to have some uh, provide some uh, useful information, uh, but with the current techniques that we have, uh, we can really um, uh, make a diagnosis in the early stages because they might be completely normal. There are some sort of um, promising um, um, uh, tools like the FTG, uh, the uh, uh, MIBG SPECT, also the um, alpha synuclein and tau traces, but still a lot of research is needed before this can become available in clinical settings. And that was my part of the talk. And I'll uh, pass it on to uh, Kelly now, so she can talk about treatment and management. Thank you. Okay, so my name's Kelly and I've been working as a Parkinson's nurse now for around about five years and play an active role in looking after the atypical patients at Newcastle. So you've already heard from Annette and Nicola about the different types of atypical forms and I'm going to take you through the MDT approach um, and how it can be useful and the approach we take in Newcastle. And um, so you might already know some of the patients and their families and um, because they might have had a diagnosis of Parkinson's for a few years and some of their symptoms have progressed. 
um, and now they've developed some new problems. They say the medications aren't working anymore, um, and and we think, or we might, may think the diagnosis may have changed. And some of the patients that you'll meet along the way may be very new to their atypical diagnosis. So if you look at the diagram from Bloom, it looks at how the patient and the family need to be at the centre of their care. Um, there's lots of other health professionals that can be involved. We can't be all be the experts, so it's important to know who to refer on to and where they are and where to find them. I find that good communication between the family is vital and clear communication and documentations between other health professionals within the team. It's important to talk to the patients about um, what other care professionals are out there and what they do and how they may help um, and how we can manage some of their symptoms together. It's quite a collaborative approach. And then it's quite often, and I find this the most difficult part of looking after these atypical patients, is talking about advanced care planning and how important it is to refer to palliative care, maybe early on or at that later stage. Palliative care isn't just about end of life treatment, but it's looking, they're really good at looking at sort of the non-motor symptom management. So that, that's the worst part for me, I'm pretty poor. <laughs> So I'm now going to talk about um, our Parkinson's, uh, our movement disorder service in Newcastle. So there's a picture on the left of some of our staff um, that work in the movement disorder service. Um, so we have around 150 patients with atypical Parkinson's disease and we run atypical Parkinson's clinics every three months and it's a regional service. The service includes three movement disorder neurologists and four clinical nurse specialists in Parkinson's disease. We also have a specialist neurophysiotherapist that comes along and we have a neuro speech and language therapist and the palliative care consultant comes along and she has a couple of specialist nurses who um, are palliative care specialist nurses and it was really this really works well as we have an MSA nurse um, who works in MSA charity. She's called Katie Rigg and she comes along um, to the clinics and sometimes has made contact with these patients already and tells us if they've got any problems in the community and also sits in um, to the clinic in the clinic rooms with us as well. It's a really busy clinic and it never runs on time. <laughs> a lot of the patients um, need ambulance transport so they run late. And generally we have a meeting just before clinic starts to discuss any research trials that are going on. And um, we talk about any patients that we've got concerns about. They may have been ringing a little bit often or they would have seen another member of the team and they've let us know they've got issues. So how our clinic works. So like I've said, we're a regional service. We have, the th we have the clinics that run every three months and we all work alongside each other. We generally see about 36 to 40 patients between us in clinic. Um, most of the patients are booked in for one clinic appointment and they may see a Parkinson's nurse and they may see a neurologist. The first few slots are for patients um, that ha have a new diagnosis. They may have been referred from their DPs or other neurologists and then they're given their diagnosis of the atypical and a typical form of Parkinson's. Um, these patients are more than welcome to see speech and language therapists, the nurses, the physios at any point within that within that meeting. Um, and then, but a lot of them I find always want to digest the diagnosis first. And then after that, we ring the patients, the Parkinson's nurses ring the patients, and um, we tend to talk to them about their diagnosis. And what we do for documentation is we um, created a crib sheet which is on the other side of the screen um, and we document this in the notes so what we go through is um, we send them an information leaflet it's about four pages long it has all our information on information about driving um, information about what the service is who they'll see um, information about charities um, and then we run through their medications with them if they've been given any in clinic have they had any side effects has anything improved has anything not improved and then we talk to them about the different support networks and then we also mention to them about who can be involved in their care um, going over the physio and the speech and language and also talk to them about their diet and how exercise is really helpful and then we run through if they would like to run through some of their features of their atypical problems and talk to them about how how um, certain things may be useful. Um, so um, if the patient has been diagnosed for a while, um, it's a little bit different. They come into clinic and they either see the nurses or the neurologist and we look at their current problems. They also have the options to book in with a physio, palliative care or speech and language. But a lot of these patients have this input already, but if they need to see one, someone in clinic in a space, we book them in. Um, and 
the clinics changed while COVID was around, actually. We used to always see the patients face to face, but because of COVID, we changed the clinic setup. We give patients the options to be seen face to face um, or um, by telephone. We understand that transport can be difficult for this group of patients. And if some things haven't changed and nothing's progressed and they just want reassurance, we always offer that support of a telephone call and they know that they can ring into the helpline if they're ever needed on the, for the Parkinson's nurses. So after that clinic, we have another meeting. It's like meetings all day. Um, and then we talk about... Um, we talk with the palliative care consultants and the different and we link up with the different hospices around Newcastle um, and we discuss the patients that are already involved with the hospices. They have their own set of occupational therapists, social workers, physios. And if there's anyone that we're a little bit worried about, we talk together. And if there's any new patients that we need to refer and the hospices tell us what we need to do or if they're out of area, which are the best areas to, to, um, to tap into. So when patients come to clinic, um, we need to understand that every patient deserves expert care and they have to be referred on to the appropriate healthcare professionals to help. Every patient has their own set of problems and it's really important to personalise their care. Care strain has a massive impact and has obviously been made worse by COVID. So we have to build up a quite a rapport with the patient quite quickly. And it's sometimes difficult to do that in such a short space of time. I think it's really important to get to know your local area, tap into charities, Parkinson's UK, um, MSA and PSP associations. They're all really good at find, finding different um, charities and if there's anything available such as exercise or um, um, if they have, need any more drug help on the PSP website, there's lots of um, information on the drugs and also on the Parkinson's UK. And, and time in clinic is so, it's tight. And because we see so many patients, we created a movement disorder questionnaire, which you can see. And when people come to clinic, I always find that they forget what they want to talk about or um, they know they haven't got long. So we created a movement disorder questionnaire so they can put three things um, down that, that is really bothering them and then tick any of those symptoms. And we find we can focus just on those things. Um, they're given that questionnaire on arrival and it gives them the opportunity to write down any problems, motor or non-motor. So the services that we tend to tap into, um, because we can't all be the jack of all trades, so there's experts there to help you. We tap into the bladder and bowel support service, whether it's a urology problem or um, and they need to see a doctor or we have an excellent nurse led service. Um, we can refer locally for salaria problems. So we also refer for Botox. Um, it's important to know your social services. They help with lots of funding and care support. And um, I find the OTs and the physios who go out to the houses um, are very, they're, they're so important because they can tell me what's going on in, in the home. And the OTs are really good at making assessments who, for people who need different equipment to help, help them. And if we can just keep people in their own homes so much better. Um, we link really well into the PSP, the MSA and the PSP charity. Katie Rigg is amazing and she really knows her patients well. And, and she comes and sees them, like I've said, um, with the doctors and nurses in the room. We've got great links with the gastro team um, for people who need pegs or run into people's uh, problems with pegs. And it's really important to um, remember that the GP should be the key person. Clear communication with the GP is so important. We always write to the GPs after clinic um, regarding the, like, the continuity of care, such as medication and support services. And that's also linking in with the district nursing teams. OK, so I'm now going to talk about um, a gentleman that I have been looking after. So this is a real whistle top store, uh, stop store about the, the case study of mine. OK. Um, so he's a 75-year-old um, man. He was diagnosed with Parkinson's when he was 68, so about seven years ago. So his initial, his initial symptoms were resting tremor for about three years. And um, he had left side upper limb tremor, which was progressing to the right and lower limb. He had normal eye movements, a bit of reduced face expression, um, increased tone on his left side, some subtle bradykinesia bilaterally, but was worse on the left than a reduced arm swing. He ex explained to me that he had some restless legs, memory wasn't as good, but not too significant, and mood was a problem. He was irritable, and he had a little bit of a personality change and would become withdrawn from some social interaction. He had no bowel problems, a little bit of nocturia, good sense of smell, and his speech was starting to mumble a bit. So when he was initially seen, he was started on rapinarol. 
So you'll start on a pill and I noticed he started to be a little bit impulsive. So we also, when he was seen at that time, we started an antidepressant for his low mood and some progabalin for his restless legs. So then he wasn't seen for about six to 12 months. We came to clinic and he, he mentioned to me that he started to fall backwards and his balance wasn't great. His gait became more of a shuffle. He had some freezing of gait. He continued to eat and he was eating in the middle of the night, eating Weetabix and um, his speech was getting worse and, and more mumbly. So I decided to start him on a little bit of Levodopa, um, 125, three times a day and decreased his Repinerol. So over the next year, he started to develop more non-motor symptoms. Sleep was poor, balance wasn't getting any better. I increased his levodopa up to 187.5 milligrams three times a day, but it really made a minimal impact on his um, body kinesia, his tremor and tone remained the same. And he was still managing the community independently and he was still driving. In about 2019, his wife, went, his wife had mentioned new, more new symptoms. He was dizzy, his mood wasn't so good. So we referred him to um, a CPM for some mental health support and he was started on paroxetine and metazepine. Um, he was impulsively eating and we noticed, his wife had noticed when he was eating, he was cramming the food into his mouth and he was now weighing over 18 stone. Um, he had a massive impact on his mobility. So I referred him to the speech and language therapist for his speech and his swallowing and the occupational therapist for any equipment he may need at home. When I, see, when, I seen, um, when I seen him again, his balance was even worse and he kept always falling backwards, especially when he was standing up from a chair. Paddy Kinesia was slightly worse on the upper and lower limbs and was slightly more increased tone and he had a little bit more of a stooped posture. On examination, his eye movements had changed. His saccades were slow up and down, they were slightly reduced um, and he wasn't keen on medications, this gentleman. So I thought, oh, am I still treating the Parkinson's here? I thought, well, I better add a little bit of Rosadoline and he didn't want any more leaf dopa. And he never really said to me he was having wearing off and he thought that he was getting some benefit from his leaf dopa. But the real change was I noted his speech, the volume had been reduced and I noticed he was repeating um, like a repetition of other words that we were using. So a little bit of echolalia. Um, and then COVID happened and then he didn't come to clinic for some time. All our Parkinson's clinics were changed to telephone. And in this time, Mr. R became much more frail and was admitted to uh, ITU with a chest infection. And we all know what happens when people get admitted with a chest infection. It takes them a long time to get better and um, when they've got Parkinson's. But he did make it home, but then he was a lot more frailer. He wasn't admitted to our group of hospitals, so we never got seen from a Parkinson's point of view. So he didn't have his medications looked at um, and didn't really have any, they just treated the chest infection really. Um, so um, a few months later, he was then um, back in with another chest infection, but he was admitted to our group of hospitals this time. So the ward had called me and said, oh, I think you should come and have a look at this guy. He's still like Parkinson's medication isn't making much of a difference. Um, and um, I was a bit like, well, he's got an infection again. Does he need a Parkinson's um, review of his medication? So I went to see him a few days later. And as I walked into the ward, I could see he was rather undertreated. He was stooped in his chair. He had global body kinesia and rigidity. His eye examination was worse. He had poor eye movement up and down with a clear, with clear, um, clear overactive frontalis. And when I looked at him a little bit closer, he had a positive pause line. Um, his speech was really un unintelligible at times and um, with some speech apraxia. And he was starting and he had apraxia also. He, he was showing me how to brush his hair, brush his teeth, and he was really apraxic. So at this point, I thought maybe we need to revisit this man's diagnosis as he could have um, an atypical form. So he was seen by the movement disorder uh, consultants and his diagnosis changed to uh, probable PSP. So the red flags that should have really um, come to me when I kept exa examining him and seeing him, his balance was poor. And Annette spoke about these at the beginning. His balance was poor. He was falling backwards. His speech was poor. He was cramming his food. His mood was low. He was dizzy. The pills weren't making any difference. And then exa examination had changed more so. His saccades were slower and the overactive frontalis and speech. So now we've given, we now we need to think about that change in diagnosis. It's how did I go and how did the doctors go about changing his diagnosis and telling him his wife? And I think if you go back to Annette's first slide, we have to think about whether it's like possible or probable Parkinson's disease, but he was just given the idiopathic Parkinson's disease. So his wife was like to, said to us, 
how did you get that so wrong? He's had Parkinson's for years. Why has it changed? Is he going to die? And how did we answer these questions? And she was more concerned of, well, he's got this new diagnosis, but has it delayed treatment? And, and why has it made him so, so much worse so quickly? So what support did we give? So we had to re-educate the family on his new condition. They sort of lost faith in our team, but we explained about the condition. And his wife did struggle to understand how the Parkinson's had changed. So support was key for the family. And we did do things differently. Yeah, we came down on his levodopa as it wasn't making much difference. And then we tapped into all the services we needed to. So when he was discharged home, we needed OT support to see what he needed. Social services were involved with funding for carer support. Speech and language were available for his speech problems and his swallowing. The mental health team was still involved with his impulsive episodes and also um, his mood. And he did have problems with his eyes as well. He suffered from eyelid apraxia. So we ended up um, referring him to the um, ophthalmology department where they helped with Botox and given prisms for his spectacles. And um, we referred him to our complex MDT and also um, early referral to palliative care. And they are still involved with, and the district nurse team have been brilliant with him. And that's the end. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Kelly, um, Nicola and Annette. That was really, really brilliant. I would still stop before, but um, I've learned so much and I've written loads down. I hope I will understand my, my writing. Um, I've got time for a few questions um, before the short break. So um, probably either for, you, for any of you, really, um, from Dr Ali Assar, a lot of symptoms of MSA appearance appear to overlap with long COVID ones. How is it best to differentiate? Annette, go for it. Okay, I would probably start with a really careful history, isn't it? So with long COVID, you probably have that, somebody having a diagnosis of COVID and having those, you know, um, PCR or lateral flows and that history of, you know, no prodromal features. So I think it's just really about getting that history. You know, as Nicola says, you know, you've got a DAT scan there as well, which will give us an idea whether there's any dopaminergic deficiency. So at least that will tell you whether there's a, you know, a Parkinsonian consumption going on rather than a, a long COVID, because obviously a long COVID would just be a normal, normal DAT scan. But I would go on history, if I'm honest. I think, you know, you you probably pick that up um, and see um, over time. So yeah, lots of things do overlap. And I think it's sometimes difficult when, you know, people will, will complain at the minute about the, you know how things are going um, and we don't know do we we just don't know what's going to happen and what the impact that covid will have on individuals either developing parkinsonian symptoms or you know potentially progressing them further and i think we've all seen people progressing more rapidly over the last couple of years than we'd expect normally in clinical practice um but i think it's just we've got to treat what we what we see and you know what symptoms you know people progress with um but yeah i think it's just about history if that helps and if you stay stay on the line annette can early facial dystonia be a symptom of MSA? Oh, um, that's an interesting one. Um, I haven't seen it personally. Um, Nicole, have you seen that? Oh, no, no, not much of it, no. Okay, so um, we don't know. Sorry, Anonymous, we don't know. Um, there's a few questions around pharmacy um, from Stephanie, so probably for um, any of you really, but maybe for you, Kelly, when you were talking about the team. So Stephanie's asked, there's, a, there's three questions. Do you have a pharmacist in your clinical team? If you don't, obviously you refer yeah. to ph pharmacists. And if you, if you, is the community pharmacist advised of any medicines changes when you inform the GP? Um, so we don't have a pharmacist that's linked would to our Would you like team. one? I would love a pharmacist that's linked <laughs> to our <team. laughs> I think that's all Stephanie really wants to know, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but we do um, we do have a pharmacist that works on the ward. So if a patient comes in, she'll have a look at his drugs uh, or her drugs. Um, and we also um, there actually there's been more. I think things have changed since COVID, and there's more pharmacy in the GP because I tend to get a lot of pharmacists ring me. I start drugs, and then I think they get the patients in, and they literally list every single side effect, and then the patients don't want to start the drugs. But uh, yeah, I think it can work well. <laughs> Uh, brilliant. Okay. Um, another question from Dr. Ali, and I'm afraid this is probably going to be my last question because of time. So um, if I can ask Annette and Kelly 
to have a look at the other questions and maybe type the answers in for people. So last question from Dr. Ali is, um, are certain races or certain parts of the population at greater risk, do you think of atypical Parkinson's? And with cognitive issues, is it more difficult for those affected to participate in decision-making? So a two kind of two-prong attack there. What do you think? Uh, it's the question. I mean, uh, um, to be honest, um, when it comes to um, MSA or PSP, uh, unfortunately, these are uh, um, we don't have a lot of epidemiological studies because they're not very frequent diseases. So, in order to have this kind of association, you really need to look at large population as we do for for Parkinson's. Uh, there are some studies that have reported that MSA is more common in uh, people working who have lived in in a farm. But again, you, you, you really need big numbers. Um, there, is, there are nowadays more um, larger consortium. So uh, there is a French and there is a UK uh, consortium. So probably we start looking at uh, patients, uh, and, but probably these are questions that we could um, um, answer in, in the future. As to et ethnicity, um, I would say I haven't noticed any um, huge difference in our clinics, uh, not even when I was in London. Um, and uh, uh, the experience in in other um, in other um, countries, for example, in France, they have a um, large um, court of patients with uh, MSA. So um, I don't I don't think they have noticed that. The only thing I can recall is that they're living in farms. Brilliant. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to Annette, Kelly and Nicola for um, a brilliant talk, as always.